Earlier, Niger's military leaders have warned against any armed intervention in the country by the leaders of the sub-region following an emergency meeting of the Economic Community of West African States in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Niger's military spokesman, Colonel Amadou Abdramane, says that the objective of the ECOWAS meeting was to approve a plan of aggression against Niger through an imminent military intervention in Niamey in collaboration with other African countries that are non-members of ECOWAS and certain Western countries. They reminded ECOWAS of the military's firm determination to defend our homeland. General Abdurrahmane uh, Shiani, the chief of Niger's presidential guard, declared himself leader while the country's elected president, Mohamed Bazoum, is still being held by the military since the coup took place last week. Let's discuss this issue further as we're now being joined by Professor F.M. Ubi, who is the acting director of research and studies at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, NIAA, from our Lagos studios. And we also have in Abuja, a rise analyst, Dr. Constance Ikoku. Very warm welcome to Newsnight. These are trying times once again for uh, the West African sub-region, its people and the people of Niger. But let me start with you, Professor FM. The coup in Niger is said to be the first time the economic community has threatened to take military action against any uh, coupist or coup plotters. How far reaching will this go with one of the uh, resolutions of the ECOWAS leaders today in Abuja? Now, thank you for having me. Um, I think um, I will start by saying that the Economic Committee of West African States will have to really tread with caution. You know, um, there are other uh, options available. Um, military intervention should be the last of the last option. Or I would like to say that if possible, it shouldn't even come into the picture. You know, uh, if you look at many of the constitutions of uh, the 15 member states, I think you see the principles of non-intervention. Now, the question I'm beginning to ask is, under what guise will ECOWAS intervene in uh, Niger? If you look at the principles that governs uh, intervention, humanitarian intervention, or the responsibility to protect, eventually, it talks about the fact that it is either pogrom is taking place in that nation or genocide is taking place. That is when nations could intervene in order to uh, stem the genocide that is ongoing in any country. And so now that uh, they, are, they are taking an option of non-intervention, I mean, of intervening in uh, the coup in Mali, you know, uh, to restore democracy, I wonder how that is going to be feasible, but we have to await the outcome of the chief of defense staff of uh, the community to know what the outcome is, to see if they actually uh, buy the idea of, in, of military intervention. But all said, uh, nobody is in support of uh, the military incursion into politics uh, at this time of... Uh, uh, the globe, you know, uh, if you look at the post-modern era or the post-post-modern era, military incursions into politics shouldn't be seen, you know. Uh, democracy remains the best form of government, and um, we expect that every country within the region and the continent at large should imbibe democracy and practice democracy, you know. But much more importantly, uh, for me, it's, it's not actually the intervention too. Uh, what I've been worried about is we should actually look at the root cause of the problem. What, what is bringing the military back? You know, after the third wave of democracy in the 90s, a lot of countries were imbibing democracy. Everybody was happy. You know, there was jubilation everywhere. So why are the military coming back? I think we should begin to look at the root cause of the problems that are causing the resurgence of military coups in Africa. 
Uh, all right, like Prof. I I'll, I'll come back to you. Intervention should um, be one of the last be, options for yeah, me. Yeah, Prof, you seem to be uh, answering my questions already, and uh, the reason is not far fetched as the director of uh, research and you know studies. But let me come to um, Dr. Constance. Uh, yes, a lot of uh, caution must be taken. ECOWAS has no standing force right now. Um, as it used to have in the 90s during the program in Liberia and Syria alone. And some generals are warning that Nigeria really should thread cautiously against any military action against uh, the coup plotters because it may spell doom for Nigeria. That is, Iswa, for example, will be let loose knowing that Niger, Chad, Burkina Faso have been serving as buffers to the Nigerian border, blocking, you know, the incursion uh, by uh, these uh, 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 terrorists, as you would say. Do you agree to that, uh, Dr. Constance? Well, the thing to say is that um, ECOWAS has given a standard response uh, to the situation at hand condemning the coup and the coup plotters, asking for restoration of democracy and the release of uh, the president, uh, President Bazoum. Uh, but let's go to again to the underlying causes um, and the intervention, as you mentioned. If you begin to intervene in this country, how many countries will you intervene? I mean, across West Africa, for instance, there have been, uh, since 2013, over 60 attempts at uh, coup, 60% of the attempts of, uh, at coup in, in Africa has been in West Africa. So when you begin to uh, talk about intervention, are you going to do that in Mali? Are you going to do that in Chad? Are you going to do that in Burkina Faso? Are you going to do that in Guinea Conakry? So yes, the same level of energy that they have used to condemn this coup should be channeled towards addressing the underlying causes of this coup and instability in the region. I mean, people are saying that, okay, for instance, you have democracy. Democracy is supposed to deliver results and improve the lives of people. But in this so-called democracy we are talking about, the practice is not being, is not being felt by the people. You have election riggers who rig elections and come into power. You have life presidents who do not want to move. You have people who are in power and want to extend their tenures. You have all of this. So these are things that ECOWAS should channel its energy towards because those are important. But beyond this carefully crafted uh, response, there's also the issue of um, the problems that we're facing as a region. So you have, for instance, when you look at this, all these uh, uh, countries, they are Francophone, right? So there is a huge anti-France uh, sentiment sweeping across the continent. So they are doing this to get France out of uh, their way. And then there are the jihadist wars that are causing problems, decimating populations, decimating economies. You have to deal with that. And then there is the foreign interventions or interest renewed scramble for Africa. Russia is there. China is there. Um, you have um, the United States, France, and the e European Union. And then you have the private military contractors who are ever ready to jump into the mix. It's a lot of things going on at the same time. So, yes, trading with caution uh, is very important. All right. Um, Prof, would come to, you know, some of the socio, uh, political and economic sanctions already imposed, you know, on Niger and around Nigerian borders in Ilela, uh, Sokoto State, uh, some in Kirby, uh, another one in Kirby, the border closure is already uh, being enforced. And we have our correspondent in Sokoto who is reporting that visual is not ready because of the network problem. But the sanctions imposed by ECOWAS leaders have started taking a snowball effect on uh, not only Niger, but Nigeria with borders, you know, communities already counting their losses. Foodstuffs, the intertrades cannot go on again. The consequential effect can be overwhelming, don't you think so? Yes, the impact of uh, the sanctions will be overwhelming. But first, let's look at the Nigeria Republic itself. 
You know, these sanctions, most of them are economic sanctions. And sometimes I get worried, you know, when you impose economic sanctions on a country, because it's the common people, the citizens that actually uh, feel the impact of these sanctions negatively enough. It, it impacts on, on them, you know, in a whole lot of ways. And so sometimes I feel, you know, um, some sanctions should be more of political than economic because the economic is, uh, has a, a wider reach, you know, uh, to the peripheries. Now, um, it, it, with regards to the closure of border, it's going to affect trade. We have a lot of trade ongoing between Nigeria and Niger. We have a lot of uh, trade going between Nigeria and our immediate neighbors around. And so when you close the border, that aspect of trade will be, you know, will be uh, impacted upon negatively because even the Nigerian uh, 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 exporters, you know, uh, traders who uh, export to Niger will not be able to do any business with the country. Um, I think um, uh, we have to, you know, like we have all said, trade with caution. Now, let me take, for instance, the United States is even, is even very cautious in actually referring to what has taken place in Niger as a coup. In Niger, the United States is one of uh, uh, Niger's uh, allies. Uh, as a matter of fact, $500 million of aid has already been given to Niger. They are, they are, they are closest ally in terms of uh, combating insecurity within the region. And you see, they are also trading with caution because once they call what has taken place in Niger a coup, that means they have to cut their operational and assist, their military assistance to Niger. And so ECOWAS too, we should look at all the impact. Now, we, all, we, all, we initially we talked about intervention. Intervention wasn't the the option for Mali, for Burkina Faso, for um, 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 Guinea, and the, uh, the, 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 the three countries prior to Niger. Now, why, how come you're not asking for, the, the ECOWAS is asking for intervention on, uh, uh, in Niger? Now, don't you think that now this will actually form another alliance between the four, Niger, Burkina Faso, uh, Guinea, and um, uh, Mali? You know, so now if there's an intervention, don't you think this would not create another chaos within the Sahel, within Nigeria's border? And you know, Niger is our partner when it comes to fighting insecurity. And so I think there's a whole lot of ways, you know, the sanctions uh, that will impact on uh, Nigeria as well as uh, Niger. But, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, like we have said, you know, coup is not something that we should encourage. So whatever it takes to uh, eradicate uh, military purchase, should, we have to do that. You know? and, and so uh, remember, over the last couple of years, a lot of uh, arguments by analysts, by scholars, that the uh, African Union is a toothless, uh, toothless bulldog, ECOWAS is a toothless bulldog. I think, and that is why I'm sure the chair, uh, the, the, the chairman of ECOWAS and our president himself has said it is not business as usual. We have to take strong measures against uh, uh, military purchase or unconstitutional state change of uh, government in Africa and in, within this uh, region. And so I think that is why they have taken this option. But like I said, we should start with a, a softer measures, negotiations, uh, arbitration, uh, mediations, you know, we should send high level uh, de delegations, uh, international public persons to see how they could discuss uh, some form of uh, remedies for Niger in order to pave way uh, for Mohamed uh, Bazoum to come back as the president of Niger. And so we should look at various options before we now take the options of interventions, which is actually supposed to be the last option. Um, Dr. Constance, uh, let me ask you if can the most benevolent military regime be better than a skewed, you know, democratic government with obvious electoral inadequacies? Hmm. That's a difficult one. Um, it's not black and white, right? Um, so many people would prefer a democratic government but a democracy that is working, that is functioning, not a democracy where elections are not done rightly and people uh, uh, impose themselves on the masses. Um, so, I mean, people have given instances of Libya, for instance, that he was a benevolent dictator. The quality of life in Libya was very high, although you could argue that civil liberties were limited. 
whatever the, be the case, I think people would prefer a situation where there are civil liberties, there is freedom, they have their human rights and they can do whatever they want to do and then the, the government is not limited to a family. Because when you look across West Africa, for instance, you have some, uh, uh, not only West Africa, Africa, you have countries where uh, the power passes from the father to the son. Nobody wants to do that in a country. It's not your clan. It is an entire country. But going back to what is happening, when you look at um, all these countries, there is a common thread. Most of them are Francophone, so ruled by former colonial power France. And when you see the resentment on ground, there's a huge anti-France sentiment. And it is because of a couple of reasons. They, they believe that most of the economic uh, agreements do not favor them. And then it doesn't bring development to them. So they want most of these countries to be out of their domain. And then there is also the cultural imposition, there is the exploitation of resources that they think does not work in their interest. So these are issues that the AU and ECOWAS need to look at more closely. You need to provide economic prosperity in these countries, mm -hmm. you need to banish poverty, you need to uh, uh, promote transparency, you need to promote a good governance. And then the states, the institutions have to be strengthened, the state has to be strong. If the state is weak, this is what you get. Thank you very much. Prof, um, let's come to you quickly before we're asked to round up. Niger is a country of 26 million uh, citizens. You talked about the international interests, US, France, EU. EU has stopped uh, its uh, budgetary aid of $554 million. But this is a country rich in uranium, in gold and other um, natural resources. But yet, its poverty index is uh, number one or number two in the world. Should it be so? What are the reasons for the incessant or the gradual creeping back of coups, insurrection in West Africa? Um, yes, since Niger is our case study, um, if you have just mentioned the population of Niger, then the GDP growth rate is 1.4, and in, when you look at the corruption index, it is, it is 123 um, over, over, over 180 in terms of uh, numbers uh, ranking. Now the score is 32 over 100, and poverty level is about 38 uh, percent. You know, so you find out that. This might be one, just one of the reasons for the disenchantment, for the unhappiness, you know, that has caused uh, uh, the military push in uh, the country. Now, there are other factors, you know, um, uh, Dr. Constant has even listed a whole lot, uh, corruption, maladministration, uh, weak economic, uh, uh, weak economy. Uh, we also have, um, unemployment, extreme poverty, a failure of liberal democracy in many respects. And, you know, there have been a lot of arguments that, uh, uh, you know, the, the policies, the Western policies, liberal policies that are actually asked, uh, ask, uh, I mean, that uh, the, the West asks the, the, the developing world, precisely Africa, to implement are actually not a fit for the society. Now, so people have been asking, you know, for an identity that we have to create based on our own social, uh, uh, political or social structural dynamics, you know, something that fits the system, you know, the, 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 the domestic politics. That means, you know, whatever policies we are being asked to implement, we should look at how it is uh, fit into the system, what we should adapt. You know, we don't have to adopt everything, hook, line, and sinker, and, uh, and implement. Now, the problem is this, you know, when you adopt policies that are not, uh, that are alien to the system, it creates a whole lot of problems. You know, when you try to fuse uh, 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 an alien practice, there is that explosion, you know, if, 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 well, if we go to the natural sciences, you see how the, the catastrophic effect of uh, the nuclear bomb, you know, when you're trying to fuse an atom, together, you know, and they are repelling. It's, but when you use that force to fuse it, that is what causes the chaos, the catast uh, catastrophic uh, blast that you feel. And that's exactly what is happening uh, in uh, Af Africa. And so I think uh, the, the truth is that, and this remains the truth, is that our leaders actually know the problem. 
But the, the problem there for them, or the challenge for them, is that of implementation, that of commitment, that of uh, willingness, you know, that political will to, 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 to implement policies that are people-oriented, policies that, is, that are development-focused, policies that will give succor to the citizens. You know, we need infrastructure. We don't have infrastructure. You know, we need to upgrade. And you, you see how much it, it costs to upgrade the infrastructure. I know it's, it's a very tall order. You know, development is not just a one-day uh, 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 thing. Mm -hmm. For instance, China took 100 years to get to what it, where it, it is. Yeah. It took 100 years, a decade, for China to be modernized. And so there are lessons we could learn from countries like China, from uh, the Asian Tigers, you know. So, you know and when we learn from those lessons where we take what we need for the system. We take, we adapt, I mean, adopt and adapt what we need, mm -hmm. you know, that fits into our system and create a very sound uh, political scenario, uh, <laughs> friendly business environment yeah. that, you know, that mm -hmm. could create a, a succor and, and, and give the, the citizens the sense of belonging. And, As and accelerate fact, development. Sorry, I, I just and need... Inclu yes, yeah. and inclusiveness. Yes, I yes. just need to yeah, come I in. Think that those are the things we really need. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, lastly, uh, Dr. Constance, when you look at the communique uh, issued by ECOWAS and the reality on the ground, for example, the funding of a standing army that can serve as an interventionist um, force or instrument in, you know, Niger and any other country, you know, that goes against the letter and spirit of the region or the sub-region. Would you think, how would you reconcile, you know, uh, the two, the stance of the coup leaders, the ECOWAS leaders and the rest? The thing is... Um a lot of these African countries, especially in West Africa, are mostly floated by Nigeria. And what I mean by that is that Nigeria helps most of these countries financially because they are in tough uh, financial situation. And so uh, we carry a lot already. I don't know how a standing force will work, except you're, you're saying that there will be foreign help, you know, with these uh, foreign countries, the EU, the United States. I mean, they're always ready to give some kind of financial assistance uh, to African countries in this regard. But then uh, when you accept money, then you have to accept other conditions that they have to give to you. The thing to note, though, is that many African leaders are not listening to their people. And many of those countries, citizens feel like their leaders are puppets. Their leaders are there to work for other people and not for them. Mm -hmm. So we have to begin to listen to our people. This is a warning. This, this is a warning. I mean, what is going on across West Africa is a warning to many African countries. It is a problem for us. Um, it could be more catastrophic than this. So we really need to get it together at the, the AU and ECOWAS and other regional bodies and do something seriously about this. Thank you so very much. No better place for you to have dropped the anchor there on this uh, ECOWAS resolution today in Abuja. Professor F.M. Ubi, Assistant Director of Research and Studies, Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. Thanks very much for coming on Newsnight. And Dr. Constance Ikoku, very warm appreciation for being part of Newsnight. You're welcome.